I always try to test it out to make sure my mic is on, but occasionally we get a bit of a, an echo there. So today's text is coming out of the book of Isaiah. Um, Isaiah is a great book. It's a fascinating book because it covers, we're going to talk a little bit about Isaiah, but it covers a wide range of several, several hundred years. And and it's kind of split into three parts, which we'll mention a little bit later. But this is out of Isaiah chapter 40, beginning with verse 27. And this is the prophet, and he is speaking to the people of Israel. Or the people of, actually it's Judah more than Israel, because Israel is essentially gone now. And it says this, Why do you say, Jacob, and declare, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? My God ignores my predicament. Don't you know? Haven't you heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't grow tired or weary. I mean, you can stop right there, right? That's good news. His understanding is beyond human reach, giving power to the tired and reviving the exhausted. Youths will become tired and weary. Young men will certainly stumble, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength and will fly upon wings like eagles. They will run and not be tired. They will walk and not be weary. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Maybe I should have had my sermon open. Prior to that, now I'm getting all kinds of messages on my iPad. Well done, Tim. See, I cannot just get everything right for one Sunday, just once, when I get everything according to plan. And, and it just it's one of these days, although that day is not today, as I say so often. No, you are not the only one. No, no, no. Your pastor lives in a perpetual state of disappointment. <laughs> Point and others being disappointed in me. Let's go, let's go to the Lord now in, in our sermon. So today we're sermon title Abandoned and Drift. This is a great picture um, of an old gas station uh, and it's just overgrown with graffiti. Um, and it kind of gives you an idea of something that's just been abandoned and lost. And so I want to ask you today, have you ever felt like you had been left on your own? Abandoned. Maybe it was at work and this big project comes in. It's here, it's Grayson and I, we have this great thing. We, we send kind of memes back and forth when we're in class or, and, and we're assigned a group project. I detest group projects because group projects mean Tim project and nobody else and I get abandoned, right? And that's like kind of the way it is. And there's this great gif of where it's like this group project, these four people are in a, in a golf cart and it's just sinking underwater and it's like, this is our group project. And it's kind of how it feels a lot of times when you're doing group projects. But I feel like a lot of times when you're at work or when you're at home or when you're doing things with others, it feels like you, you've been abandoned and you're having to do everything. Or maybe you've felt abandoned in, in other circumstances. Well, the people of Israel that are being addressed here in Isaiah 40 are being held in captivity in Babylon and they have been there for a very, very long time. We're talking about a generation when this is written. So 40, 50 years maybe. And it's during this time that we see written Psalm 137, a very famous psalm. Let me read it to you. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept when we remembered Zion. There, on the poplars, we hung our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs. Our tormentors demanded songs of joy. They said, sing us one of the, heart, the songs of Zion. How can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? It's, that's when this psalm is written. They're looking around, and they're wondering, what happened? Why are we here? We've had children that were born here in Babylon. We've given our children away in marriage here in Babylon. This is not Zion. 
Our text comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Now, most scholars believe that Isaiah and the person writing this is new. So you've got kind of the original prophet Isaiah writes somewhere between like chapters 1 through 39. And then scholars believe there's a break. And then at verse 40, it's another person. Some people call it Deutero-Isaiah. Some call it 2nd Isaiah. And you'll see another break at chapter 55. It's all included in one book under the title of Isaiah, but, but the times don't work. Chapters 1 through 39 are widely regarded, as I said, to be the original Isaiah's words. He had been warning them of impending doom and judgment. Go back and read. Oh my goodness. I would love for you to go back and read Isaiah, read Hosea, read Micah, read Nahum, read these works and of how the prophets are calling out Israel and Judah. Stop being un unjust, unjust. Stop treating people wrong. Stop perverting justice. Stop oppressing the or you see it constantly throughout these prophets. And so Isaiah 1 through 39, you see it again. It's just where during this time that one of the prophets will actually say, let justice roll down like waters and mercy be everlasting. You see all these things. And then, beginning in verse 40, there's a complete switch. With a message being given to a captive people who were nearing the point of hopelessness. The switch is abrupt and jarring, and I want, to, I want to read to you a little bit of it. And so this starts in chapter 39. Actually, I just want to go ahead and read chapter 39. So listen to this. <clears throat> At the time of Merodach Baladon, son of Baladon, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah letters and a gift because he had heard of the illness and recovery. So this is down during the years of Hezekiah. This is probably close to 100 years before the Babylonian captivity. Right? So this is well before that, that Isaiah is talking. Hezekiah received the envoys gladly and showed them what was in the storehouses. This also corresponds with 2 Kings chapter 20. The silver, the gold, the spices, the fine oil, his entire armory, and everything found among his treasures. There was nothing in the palace or in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them, the representatives of Babylon. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, What did those men say, and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came to me from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Okay, that's, probably don't want to do that with a foreign power. Don't take them around showing them all your gold. That's unwise. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. And so that kind of is an impending doom, which will come during first Jehoiakim's reign when a first group will be carried away. And then Judah comes to end under King Zedekiah when they're all carried away. But then we go to chapter 40, one verse later. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, and that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. It's a complete switch. And it's jarring. It's like, wait a minute. You just said they're going to be carried away. And now it's like comfort. Comfort Jerusalem. Chapter 40. This whole chapter leads us on an exposition into God's greatness. And how there were no other gods besides Israel's God. Now, for Israel. 
you might be wondering, because I certainly was wondering, why does this need to be said? Why does it need to be said that God's great, that there are no other gods? Why should that even matter? We've got stories, right? Oh, Elijah did great things. Elisha did great things. Moses did great things. We have all this history. Why does the prophet throughout chapter 40 need to be telling them there's no other God? God's done great things. God is amazing. God is majestic. God can do this. God can do that. He's always done these things. And all the other gods are just pieces of wood and stone. They've got no power, nothing. Shouldn't Israel already know how great God is? And sometimes it's a question we need to ask that we need to be told as well. Or we ask of ourselves, shouldn't I know this about God? In fact, the truth is, many had begun to question whether or not God was really the strongest and most powerful deity after all. They were questioning. Maybe God's not quite so powerful. Maybe... Among the pantheon of gods that are worshipped throughout this area, our God is less than powerful. And then you're like, wait a minute, how, why would they think that? Well, let's talk about this captivity that they're in. Israel was supposed to be a covenant people, people of promise. God has made a covenant and promise with them, and they have covenanted with God. And what's interesting is the covenant was tied to not just the people, but it was taught, tied to the land. Land was everything. Remember, we've got Abraham way back in Genesis being told, go out there and look. See the stars in the sky. See the sands of grain. Your descendants are going to outnumber them. And this land is going to be yours. The same promise is made to Isaac to Jacob. And then Joseph leaves instructions as, as all the people have come into Egypt before they become slaves. Hey, when we leave this land to go back to Canaan, take my bones with you. And then Moses comes along and tells Pharaoh, let my people go. I need to take them to a land that's been promised to them. And they finally make it to the promised land. All of this was known as the covenant between them and God. The land was so key to it. So it wasn't just that they'd been defeated. You understand, Israel had been defeated in battles before. That's not as big a deal, although it's a big deal to lose. But, but they had been removed from the land. They'd lost the land. The, wait, God, the land is part of your covenant. We're not in the land anymore. What has happened here? And not only that, it was done at the hands of the Babylonians who worshipped a foreign god called Marduk. And it's like, the covenant has been broken. We have been defeated. We've been removed from our land, which leads to the inevitable question, right? Think about it. Is the Babylonian god more powerful? And if the Babylonian God is not more powerful than maybe, just maybe, we've been forgotten. So these questions about God's existence and power are in their minds. They're right there at the forefront. If the Babylonians are able to unseat Israel, destroy Jerusalem, and remove the Israelite people from the land, then God either isn't up to the task of defending the covenant and defending the people, or the covenant has been disregarded, and God has simply moved on. And they're wondering why their legitimate interests are being ignored by God. We are your covenant people, and we are here in Babylon. And now, now can you hear the depth of the pain in Psalm 137? By the rivers of Babylon, we sat and we wept when we remembered Zion. Now you can really inhabit that pain and grief that they are questioning and that they are struggling with so hard. 
and what has set in for them and what sets in for us when we hit these points in our lives is despondency. Just despondent. There's no joy. There's no happiness because we have lost hope. They are looking around at their circumstances and wondering if there will ever be any good news. Is there ever anything that's going to come out of this? Are we just to become Babylonians? No longer people of the covenant. Here we sit in Babylon. We've lost our homes. We've lost our land. We've lost our friends. Family members have been killed. All is lost. Our cause has been forgotten by God. He's probably not even aware of our circumstance. Hear that. Hear what they're saying. Hear the agony in their voices. And so throughout this whole time, the prophet is taking chapter 40, and he's talking about all the great things of God, the great things that God has done. And then he gets to verse 27. Why do you complain, O is Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by God. It's tough to hear. Our cause is disregarded. He's like, He's saying these things. He's saying, our way is hidden. God's not aware of what's going on in our lives. God's not aware of the path that we're on, which is going away from Zion now. And then when it says our cause is, is, is neglected or disregarded, that word for cause there, it's a Hebrew word called mishpat. And it can be translated in a number of different ways from cause or our justice, our rights, our defense. Our judgment, our privileges as a covenant people. In other words, the legal rights due to us under the covenant have been disregarded. That's what they're saying. So the prophet is saying, why do you say my way is hidden from the Lord? Why do you say my cause is disregarded by my God? And you can hear it in their voices. And so, think about it from our perspective. Consider those times in our lives when there is no good news. Have you ever been there? A never-ending stream of misfortune. I will never forget about this time last year, pastoring at Springfield, and I had a member whose husband died. It was devastating. And so we began to work through the plans for the funeral. And then we get to the week of the funeral and her husband's brother comes into town with his wife. He's a diabetic, he needs constant dialysis. But they had set up where he could go and get dialysis done in Arlington. Actually, I think it was Alexandria. On the way, to dialysis, he died in the car. They get to the dialysis place, she goes running inside, they ran the crash cart out but could not bring him back. And I remember sitting there thinking, just how much more tragedy does this family have to endure? Here, this man has died, his brother has come to mourn at the funeral and he dies. It was a string of tragedies and I just thought, Ooh, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know how to begin to comfort someone like that. And we hear, you and I, when we're going through these times, we hear of all the really cool things that God has done for others, and yet we can't seem to get even the smallest prayer answered. You ever been there? I have. Gee, it's 
really good to see God doing great things in your life. Must be nice. Must be nice. And despondency sets in. And all we can see is how bad things are. And the only thing we feel is the pain we're in. Now, understand where Israel was. And they're not so different from where we end up many times in our lives, where despondency sets in. Paul, the Apostle Paul, will feel very similar to this while he was trying to serve God and get all these new churches up and running. First, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 21 through 29. Listen to this. 21. What anyone else dares to boast about, I'm speaking as a fool, I also dare to boast about. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descended from, are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Listen to this. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressures of my concern for the churches. You talk about somebody who's gone through bad times. But then he says this, because he's, he's seen some visions. He's seen things, great things from God among all this. He says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given to me a thorn in my flesh, a mes messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. We think of Paul as being this, this great apostle, which he was, of being able to endure everything. And here he is saying, enough already. Enough. I can't do this anymore. Because oftentimes in our lives, in our walks, in the day-to-day -day living, it can feel like there's no way out. There's no end to the pain. And we've all known these times in our lives. But I think we often forget we're still here. We're still here. And oftentimes we forget we've come out on the other side. The prophet tells them this. Don't lose your hope in the Lord. Listen to what he tells them. Starting in verse 28. Do you, do you not know? Have you not heard? This is back in Isaiah 40. The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. He will, and his understanding is no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. You know, I've, I've, it's an interesting passage because they will run and not grow weary. Well, I can tell you that in the two marathons I ran, that did not come true for me. I hoped in the Lord and I prayed for mercy and I got weary, very weary. The idea that is behind run is not actually a physical run. This is what we would call an idiom. For instance, if I tell you, if you change this carpet, you're opening Pandora's box. How many of you understand what I just said there? Raise your hand. Am I referring to the actual Pandora's box from the Greek myth? No, it's an idiom. I'm telling you, you're opening, you're going to have all kinds of problems if you do this. 
you sit in somebody's seat, you're, I mean, especially that person's seat, you're opening Pandora's box. Don't take their seat. And so what's meant by here, they will run and not grow weary, isn't this promise for like physical strength. It could be, but I don't, that's, I don't think that's what's being given here. What the word actually means, because the word is used again in Habakkuk, it means strength to live through circumstance. It's an idiom basically that says you'll be able to go on with life. Paul says the same exact thing in chapter back in what we had before. He says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness and insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, I believe that the prophet and Paul are both telling us the same thing. And this is what I want you to hear today. God has not forgotten you. God has not moved on from you. God has not left. God is not unaware. God is not asleep or God's attention is elsewhere. You are precious in the sight of God and God is fully aware of your circumstance. And whether you feel God's presence or not, God is present with you in the middle of them. And here's what God wants you to know today. God wants to fill you with grace to get you through the valleys of now and the valleys ahead. Just as Paul said, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness for when I am weak, I am strong. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, be with us, I pray. Give us strength in times of weakness, in times of pain, in times of hopelessness, in times of despondency. Be with us. Open our eyes so that we might see and know that you are nearby because this is what we need so badly, oh God. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said,